Hey, girl, have you done something new with your scales? Using new moisturizer? Nice. It really brings out the hazel in your eyes. Oh, hold on. Are you using whitening strips, too? Your fangs look good, girl. Really good. A really charming snake charmer? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. Wait, what? Have you been doing Pilates, too? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Hello, it's Monday, October 23rd, 2017. You are listening to Inception Radio Network, voice of the fringe majority. This is Carol Carl with UFO Headline News. And the news for the Skywatch part of your day tonight. It says here, keep watching the moon, Saturn, and Antares. Tonight and tomorrow night, let the waxing crescent moon be your guide to the planet Saturn. The moon will be easy to spot above the sunset point. That nearby bright star-like object, that will be Saturn, the sixth planet outward from the sun. Seek the moon and Saturn as soon as darkness falls, or when these two celestial beauties are highest up for the night. From mid-northern latitudes, the moon and Saturn follow the sun beneath the horizon by early to mid-evening, and from the southern hemisphere, these two worlds set at late evening. Although the moon and Saturn are close together on that great dome of sky, these two worlds are in fact nowhere close together in space. The moon, our closest celestial neighbor, is a little over 251,000 miles, or 404,000 kilometers from Earth. And yet Saturn, the farthest world you can easily see with your unaided eye, lodges way out there at nearly 4,000 times the moon's distance from us. At present, Saturn is about 10.63 astronomical units, those AUs, from Earth, and 10 astronomical units from the Earth. Remember that thing, one astronomical unit equals one Earth-Sun distance. Tonight, both the Moon and Saturn reside in front of the constellation Ophiuchus, or some say Ophiuchus. Let's spell it. It's O-P-H-I-U-C-H-U-S. As always, the moon moves its own diameter eastward in front of the constellations of the zodiac in about one hour's time. Saturn, on the other hand, is now moving eastward through Ophiuchus as well, but at a snail's pace. Whereas the moon will exit the constellation Ophiuchus to enter the constellation Sagittarius in about a day or so, Saturn won't enter into that constellation Sagittarius for another four weeks. You won't have too much longer to watch Saturn in the evening sky. This world is quickly sinking toward the glare of sunset day by day. Saturn will disappear, in fact, from the evening sky, but just for a while, by late November or early December of 2017. Here's the bottom line. Nightfall tonight and tomorrow night, October 23rd and 24th, you can use the moon to locate the planet Saturn. And Bruce McClure, who writes this for EarthSky.org, also reminds us if we're lucky enough to get our hands on a modest backyard telescope, we might even be able to see the rings of Saturn. Wow. Here's another wow for sure. Rewind just a bit. The Dawn mission and Ceres, the place where we were seeing those strange white spots. Rings? Were they rings of salt? Were they methane ice? Water ice? They seem to be reflective. Something up there on the dwarf planet Ceres. Here's a headline. NASA is extending Dawn's mission over Ceres for a second time. This is written by Andrew Liptak for TheVerge.com. In June of 2016, the Dawn spacecraft reached the end of its primary mission over dwarf planet Ceres. Since then, that spacecraft has remained in orbit around that dwarf planet where it continued to monitor and study the surface. This week, NASA has announced a second mission extension for the probe, one that takes its closest look yet at the solar system's largest dwarf planet. When Dawn arrived in orbit around Ceres in 2015, it provided scientists with an unprecedented look at the asteroid belt's largest object. It revealed new features which did indeed turn out to be made of salt, an active surface, and even organic compounds. There was still fuel left over once it completed that mission, 
And while scientists considered sending the spacecraft to another undisclosed asteroid, they eventually opted to remain in high orbit and continued to study Ceres. For this new mission extension, Dawn's flight team is looking into ways to bring the probe into a new orbit around Ceres, one that could take it to less than 120 miles above its surface. Previously, Dawn's lowest orbit brought it to within 240 miles above the dwarf planet. And according to NASA, the extension's primary focus will be to use the spacecraft's gamma ray and neutron spectrometers to study the upper layer of Ceres' crust to see how much ice it contains. This mission extension means that Dawn will be active around Ceres in April 2018, when that dwarf planet is at its closest point to the Sun. Scientists are hoping that this will show if that closer distance is enough to melt the ice on its surface. And if so, this helps form that thin, transient atmosphere. Scientists will also use Dawn's visible and infrared mapping spectrometer to study Ceres' mineral composition and will continue to take visual light pictures of its surface. Mission planners believe that the probe will be able to operate until late 2018. Unlike the Cassini spacecraft, which recently burned up in Saturn's atmosphere in September, the Dawn probe will remain in orbit around Ceres to avoid contaminating its surface. And that's a good thing. From Technobuffalo.com, here's a headline. Moon Cave discovered that could act as a location to establish a lunar colony. A second wow. This is written by Ron Dewell for Technobuffalo. Expanding human presence at our nearest celestial body, the Moon, has long been a dream of astronomers and their agencies here on Earth. However, an environment unfit for human life, not to mention cost, distance, sustainability, have always proved to be the biggest roadblocks in those ambitious plans. A recent discovery by JAXA, that's Japan's space agency, provides a promising location for a potential Moon base that could help eliminate several problems that come attached to building on the surface of the moon. Japan's Selenological, that's spelled S-E-L-E-N-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, and Engineering Explorer, and they call her Selene, probed the used radio waves to help uncover an enormous cave. That cave is in the Marius Hills, roughly 50 kilometers, 31 miles long, and 100 meters wide. The data results reveal that the massive size of the cave would allow for structures to be built soundly anywhere from several dozen to 200 meters below the surface. And scientists also predict that the rocks within the cave contain water and ice particles that can be used as fuel. Scientists believe that this cave, roughly 3.5 billion years ago, once served as a lava tube. JAXA senior researcher Junichi Haruyama claimed to the Guardian publication that the agency hypothesized about the existence of these caves before, but this is the first evidence that proves their existence. He also stated they're the best bet for establishing lunar bases during a time when agencies from around the world are looking to return to the moon. Haruyama states that these caves, quote, might be the best candidate sites for future lunar bases, because of their stable thermal conditions and the potential to protect people and instruments from micrometeorites and cosmic ray radiation. The same stable and protected environment that would benefit future human explorers also makes them an enticing target for scientific study." End quotes. The next step, to fully explore the cave and see if it can live up to scientific expectations. Moon Cave Spelunkers, a whole new world. And it seems we have shifted a bit in our world. Astonishing, but this is the headline from Newsweek. It's a special edition of that mainstream, well-respected magazine. And on their cover, a special Newsweek edition, Life Beyond Earth? Question mark. The mission to find the answer and we found the coverage about this article, about this information, at openminds.tv, posted by Alejandro Rojas. Here we go. Mr. Rojas' headline for his article, Newsweek Special Edition covers UFOs and the search for aliens 
in a positive light. Newsweek recently released a special edition magazine titled Life Beyond Earth, The Mission to Find the Answer. And while one might expect it to be dominated by stories about NASA's search for extraterrestrial microbes or the SETI Institute's search for extraterrestrial radio signals, instead, it is full of information about topics such as UFO investigations and alien abductions. Alejandro Rojas writes, that might make some of our readers, and you gentle listeners, cringe in fear of ridicule, but the stories are balanced and largely treat the topics positively. The magazine has a lot of pictures. Some of them are rare pictures in remarkable condition. The kind of pictures writers like Alejandro Rojas search hours for, so that's why he got excited. Some of the pictures were even provided by OpenMinds.tv. With so many pictures, the stories are short, but they cover a large variety of topics. The stories range from ancient alien-type topics to the Mars rover. What's exciting is that the UFO and alien stories are mixed in with the conventional science-based stories, treating them all equally. There's also diversity within the topics. For example, their coverage of alien abduction covers experts who describe more positive experience and those who do not. The more popular cases such as Betty and Barney Hill, the first alleged abduction to receive media coverage, and Travis Walton are also included. As an example of the tenor of the stories, when dealing with abduction, they include a 1993 study from the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, which found people claiming to be abducted by aliens to be as intelligent and prone to fantasy as the general public. Another interesting aspect of the magazine is a section on how UFOs and aliens have influenced art. From wild comic books in the 1950s to blockbuster movies and TV shows, for instance, The X-Files today. The magazine even recommends sources for more information. It references books and a particularly interesting podcast. This is a plug that Alejandro inserts here called Open Minds UFO Radio. He says you have to check out that podcast. And he says you should also check out the magazine. It's on the shelves in every grocery store. Pretty easy to find. Hmm, do we sense the winds of change? Let's see what's up with Robert Bigelow, shall we? From the DenverPost.com, byline for Christian Davenport, here's this. Headline, Las Vegas millionaire plans to build orbiting space station for the moon. The moon, that cold gray outpost that NASA last visited 45 years ago, is hot again. The vice president says so. So do Elon Musk and Jeffrey P. Bezos. And as the Trump administration sets its sight on the lunar surface, an ever-growing number of companies say they're ready for the challenge. The latest, Bigelow Airspace, that Las Vegas-based maker of inflatable space habitats. In an announcement last week, the company said it's hoping to send one of its space stations to lunar orbit by 2022 in partnership with United Launch Alliance, the joint venture of Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Bigelow, run by millionaire Robert Bigelow, the founder of Budget Suites of America, has spent hundreds and millions of dollars developing space habitats made from Kevlar-like materials that get inflated once they get to space. One of its smaller habitats, that bounce house in space as we call it, known as the BEAM, is currently attached to the International Space Station, where it's been tested for months. Now, Bigelow Aerospace proposes sending a much larger version. It's called the B-330. They want to send that into orbit around the moon. If NASA goes for it, the $2.3 billion mission would go something like this. The habitat would launch on United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket into low Earth orbit, where it would stay for a period of months receiving supplies and cargo while undergoing testing to make sure everything is working properly. Then a space tug would ferry it from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, where it would essentially become a space station for the moon. In laying out his plan during an interview last week, Bigelow said he was well aware of the political and industry implications for such a mission. 
The Trump administration is looking for a first-term coup. And he said, quote, this can actually be done within one administration, end quote. NASA also needs a destination for the Space Launch System and Orion spacecraft that it's been developing for years and at great expense, Bigelow said. And furthermore, his plan could involve different sectors of that growing space industry, which our current administration said it wants to help foster. While that company, United Launch Alliance, would launch the B-330, Elon Musk's SpaceX could resupply it while in Earth orbit. And then there's Jeff Bezos. Computer, execute 12.4p operation. Optimizing algorithm. Running encryption packet alpha. Night, night. Oh, I don't feel so good. What? What is it, computer? Is it hot in here? It feels hot in here? I feel a little clammy. I should lie down or something. A computer with a virus? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. Those oysters Rockefeller were a mistake. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. He says his Blue Origin is developing a lunar lander that could ferry supplies to the surface of the moon. Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, has said, quote, It's time to go back to the moon, this time to stay, end quotes. And during a recent speech, Elon Musk said, It's 2017. We should have a lunar base by now. What the hell has been going on? End quotes. Other companies are interested as well. Moon Express says it plans to send a lunar lander to the moon by next year. And then there's Astrobotic and Maston Space Systems. They're working with NASA to develop vehicles that could touch down on the surface of the moon. And during a recent speech... Vice President Mike Pence vowed to, quote, return American astronauts to the moon, not only to leave behind footprints and flags, but to build the foundation we need to send Americans to Mars and beyond, etc. End quotes. All of which adds up to a growing momentum for returning to the moon since Gene Cernan, the last man on the lunar surface, well, that was 1972, Said Robert Bigelow, quote, we don't want to see another 45 years go by. Something needs to happen, end quotes. And now the question is, will NASA go for it? Here at UFO Headline News on Inception Radio Network, you can be sure we will keep you posted. When we find it, you will hear it. Some more droning on about, well, drones. Here's a headline. Wireless charging will make drones always ready to fly. Roberto Baldwin wrote this for Engadget. Drones are great until you realize running all those propellers, a camera, GPS, and other assorted technology bits are a real drain on the battery. If you're just using one for images, it's not too big a deal. But if you're using a drone for surveying, security, or delivering burritos... Swapping out batteries all the time can be a huge pain and a time suck. Fortunately, there's a new wireless charging landing pad on its way. Enter the Wibotic, that's spelled W-I-B-O-T-I-C, power pad. It's a three-foot by three-foot landing station that comes with an onboard charger, which can be attached to pretty much any drone, according to the company. The company says the weather-resistant platform can be mounted pretty much anywhere and can help alleviate the need to handle drones that run automated flights on a regular basis. The power pad can also serve as a waypoint for long-distance flights. If a drone needs to survey a large plot of land, for instance, it can stop, recharge at regular intervals on distributed platforms. There's no word yet on pricing or when this pad will be available, but there are sure to be more than a few companies interested in reducing the time, that time spent swapping batteries while gathering data about battery health in the deployed drones. Drones, mostly a good thing when it comes to identifying what's flying around in the sky. Well, it makes it a difficult thing. Complicates the UFO sighting reports for sure. And speaking of UFO sightings, we found one in Plymouth, England, courtesy of ufostalker.com. It's got a MUFON case number. They issue numbers to each report for purposes of tracking and identification, hopefully. Here's MUFON case number 87466. 
The date of this sighting is October 1st, 2017. It wasn't reported to anybody until the 20th of October. Here's the summary. Orange sphere descended slowly down and then ascended at a steady speed, then simply vanished. Sighting specifics list of viewing distance unknown. The altitude was over 500 feet, no cloud cover. The sighting duration was five seconds, so it's quite understandable our witness simply lists object features as none. The flight path of this thing was other, and its shape, bullet, missile-like. And as that old poem goes, we'll just have to weather the weather whatever. No remarks here about meteorology at the time of this event. Here's the event, first-person words of our witness. I was walking home across a dark park. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And then in front of me, at approximately 47 degrees above the horizon, I saw an orange object fly across the sky. It seemed to bounce off the stratosphere and then speed up. This was not a meteorite. There was no tail. And then it sped up and shot across the sky at a big, great speed. And then it vanished. This all happened very quickly. I came home and told my partner, and then I told my mom. And this morning, I googled this description. The net is absolutely full of similar sightings. I know what I saw, and it's the second time in my life I've seen foreign objects in the sky. And again, it's something orange. Interesting. Hold on now while we execute a dramatic shift in trajectory from Plymouth, England to Hot Sulphur Springs, Colorado. That's the setting for MUFON sighting number 87498. This took place 9-13-2017, but nobody reported it until 10-21-2017. Here's the summary. Dark in color, with a slight glimmer on the edges. Less defined upon zooming in. Cigar shape. There is a photo attached to this submission. You can check that out later for yourselves at ufoheadlinenews.com. The sighting specifics lists a viewing distance of over one mile. The altitude was over 500 feet, no cloud cover. Sighting duration, two minutes. Object features, none and unknown. The flight path of this object was a path and then hovering. And besides the cigar shape, it's noted here by our witness, this object was also shaped like a blimp. The event seemed to go something like this. On the highway, 40 west, 3 to 5 miles west of Hot Sulphur Springs, Colorado, late morning, September 13th, 2017, near mile marker 200. Looking at the high canyon walls while driving, my wife was snapping photos. We noticed a very odd, slow-moving, hovering, black-in-color shape. It seemed to be rectangular, almost cigar shape. It had a faint glimmer around its edges. It seemed to be moving like a flowing vapor. I could only view for two seconds at a time while driving, so I asked my wife to look and see where this thing was going. She snapped a dozen pictures during the event, but... As she snapped, she did not see where this thing went. Puzzled, I wished my wife could have actually seen more. We were unable to get to a safe place to pull over. It's a dangerous stretch with the Colorado River below, jagged cliff rock on the other side. So eventually we lost sight due to the switchback curves on that road. When we returned home, we downloaded these films into the computer, we found out that my wife never saw what she was shooting, but six photos had the object fully in the frames. Well, that happens. You take a shot of just something, a canyon wall, and boom, later, there it is. Whatever it is. Can't hang around and discuss this anymore today. We've just looked at that clock, which indicates we've got to fly. Because... That's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Inception Radio Network. Follow this broadcast at ufoheadlinenews.com. Take care of each other. We're all in this together. This is Carol Carl. See you tomorrow. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to GEICO. I'm so happy, I feel like I can fly. 
Disclaimer, you will not be able to fly by switching to GEICO. This is against the laws of physics and nature. If you find yourself flying, please seek professional and or medical help immediately. In the unlikely event you find yourself flying, you might be a superhero or a pigeon or a superhero named Pidge Woman who was bitten by a radioactive pigeon. If you are indeed Pidge Woman, GEICO retains all licensing publishing rights in the event Pidge Woman the movie becomes a top-grossing Hollywood blockbuster. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.